Hey everyone, welcome back to the shop. So today we're looking at a two-footed twist gauge uh, that we just put together um, for use on our rotor grinding setup specifically, but it's a pretty versatile, neat metrology tool, so I thought I'd talk about it real quick and an interesting consideration uh, that needs to be made when using using it, at least this type. So. The idea of a two-footed twist gauge is pretty simple. You have two feet, you know, separated by a distance, and then you measure uh, the distance to the plane it's sitting on in the middle. Uh, and that's what you can see here. We have the middle mess in the middle and two feet on either side. Now you can't actually have two feet. Uh, there, it needs to be. It needs to sit flat somehow. So practically, that's done by having three points just so it sits uh, nice and kinematically ideal uh, and doesn't move around. But it's effectively two feet because two of the balls are very close together. What we've got here is a steel shaft or steel body and two aluminum feet. And those can be adjusted. You can put them anywhere on here depending on what size of part you want to measure or over what distance. And then on the bottom, there's simply two balls on one side and one ball on the other side to make up the feet. These are just hardened steel ball bearings bonded in with Loctite 380. And that works quite well for this application. So what this can be used for is measuring sort of the overall flatness or curvature of a surface. Um, you know, some, some, there's some prior uh, knowledge about that surface required first. Uh, but if you have a good repeat reading on your surface and you know it's consistent over the, uh, over the, the surface, but not necessarily flat, uh, then you can use this to determine curvature. Uh, if you have a master or reference to compare it to. Um, so basically, you know, you could use a surface plate as a reference if you know it's good. Uh, you could also use it, um, you could also use other masters and one really good one for small stuff is an optical flat. This is flat to within one micro inch or 25 nanometers. So far flatter than any B-grade surface plate that we have lying around. So we can use this to zero our tool, and then if we put it on a surface that has a positive or negative curvature to it, that will show up in our reading there. Now, that's, this is not actually discussing the, the use case that's referenced in the name two-footed twist gauge when you're actually making a flat surface or scraping in ways or something you can put the two feet you know, on two corners like this and take a reading and put the two feet on two corners like this and take a reading and that will tell you how your surface is twisted and in what direction uh, and in what places need to be lapped away and that doesn't require a master that's just a comparative measurement to figure out the twist of the plane um, but for calibrating uh, actual flatness like this um, we use a master and then measure it off that way. So specifically why we made this is not for measuring you know, surface plates, but for our rotor grinding setup, which we just got running. Uh, and I'll make a video about this soon. When you have, uh, let's say, this is your workpiece here. This is spinning on an air bearing spindle. And here's your grinding wheel. And it's coming over like this in the Z axis. If this is tilted one way or another on the tilt base, you can either grind a conical surface or a, a dish surface, or a, you know, concave conical surface. Um, and so to get this whole surface completely flat across it, it needs to be aligned, uh, aligned with the z-axis of the machine um, and be perfectly level. And so we can use the two-footed twist gauge to measure across, say, for this part, put one foot here, have the indicator tip somewhere 
close to the middle there, and another foot out here. And then we can see if it's dished down or uh, dished upwards, and we know which way and how much to correct the tilt base. All right, so let's look at this uh, taking a measurement and see the results we get, and then I'll explain why they're wrong. Uh, we've got the gauge zeroed out on the optical flat here. You can see it repeats to zero decently. Uh, I really should have plastic handles on the end of this. If you were going to use it for a long time, picking up the ends, putting them down, and again, you know, heat starts to get into it, and it could creep on you. But for now, we don't have any. But what we're going to be measuring is the bottom of this uh, fully densified ceramic, uh, alumina ceramic, microcator comparator anvil. Um, I've never seen one of these before, or I've never seen other another one besides this. If anyone has any more details on that, uh, I'd love to hear about it. But that is that is what this is, uh, and it is very very flat. Um, if you know what it is, then you know why. Uh, and the back is too, and so that's what we're going to be measuring. So we're zeroed here, and we'll come over and take a look at the anvil here. So it's just a little bit below zero there, I'd call it maybe, maybe 10 millionths or so uh, out of out of flat, uh, and because the needle's below zero, that would mean that, or that would, what you would think is, you know, the surface is concave, so it's lower in the middle. Uh, and some might say, all right, cool, that's how flat that is, it's or at least, you know, along that straight line. Again, this is assuming the repeat reading is good, uh, and it's a consistent uh, curvature to the surface, but regardless, say, okay, it's out of flat 10 millionths. That's wrong. Let's look at why. So the reason is Hertzian contact stresses. And a lot of you probably already know what that is, but briefly, if you have a sphere on a plane, or a sphere on a sphere, or a cylinder on another cylinder, if you have a curved surface interacting with another surface, there's going to be a point where, theoretically, if it was an ideal shape, the area contacting the surface would be zero, meaning the stresses there would be infinity, and if you have infinite stresses, then you have to have some strain. Uh, and so, basically, you have a ball on a surface, it's going to push into that surface some amount, um, it's just a matter of how much. Uh, here I have a ball pushing into a rubber sheet. Realistically, I should have a rubber ball as well, because they're both deforming. Uh, but, depending on how uh, stiff these materials are, they'll deform different amounts. Uh, and there are a series of equations to uh, determine these deflections, but conveniently, NIST actually has them all put into a handy-dandy calculator on uh, their Engineering Metrology Toolbox website. Thanks to Robin Ranzetti for putting me onto this one. But they've got calculators for all different sorts of, all the different types of uh, the conditions for, and cases for uh, Hertzian contact stresses. And so it allows us to calculate uh, exactly how much our gauge, because remember those feet are balls, is sinking into the surface. You tell it the diameter of the ball, the material of the ball, the material of the plane, uh, and then the it will calculate the amount delta Z that the ball sinks down below the surface. So the balls sink down, the balls for the feet sink down into the silica under the weight of the whole gauge itself, 48.6 uh, micro inches. The balls sink into the alumina the, ceram the ceramic microcator anvil, only 25 micro inches. So that's a pretty significant difference in height, um, just based on the fact that 
the materials that it's sitting on are different. Um, however, the tip of the indicator is also a spherical radius, so that comes with its own set of deformations. When the tip presses down with the gauging force, and this comes out to about 55 uh, grams for, uh, for that millimess, and the force here is, I think the gauge was one and a half kilograms or so, uh, but that's, that force is divided by three because it's split across the three balls. Anyways, the tip difference uh, between the two materials is 4.7 micro inches. But these are actually acting in different directions as far as error goes. Here, when we move from the silica optical flat to the um, alumina anvil, the reading should be, you know, 22.84 inches larger than what we measure. But the tip comes out to the reading should be 4.7 micro inches smaller than what we measure. So we take the difference of these and we find in the case that I just demonstrated, whatever we measure, we should add 18.14 micro inches to that measured result to get the actual uh, change in, or the ac actual difference in curvature or straight line flatness um, to compensate for the errors due to Hertzian contact stresses. So you'll recall we measured around negative 10 micro inches indicating a concave surface but in reality when you do the math that surface was actually convex because it comes so it would come out to about 8 micro inches convex. Um, now we can't really speak definitively to these levels of precision just because that millimess has a resolution of 20 millionths or so but this still demonstrates the uh, concept and demonstrates the fact that you know those errors aren't small. Granted those are eighth inch balls that we were using on the, uh, the gauge and we probably should have uh, used slightly bigger ones to minimize this, but we have the capability to do the math. We can compensate for it and figure out the, uh, the real measurement. So that's kind of an interesting little uh, point that some people might not uh, think to compensate for when gauging between dissimilar materials with, with ball point based uh, measuring systems. But yeah, just something to think about. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.